Good morning, everybody. It's great to be back. As Nigel says, it's been quite some time since I've uh, since I was last here, and certainly uh, nobody was wearing masks the last time, so I'll give an indication um, of how long it has been. Um, but it was great to be back. Um, great to be back here and, and to spend time with you. Um, I was going to say to spend this short hour with you. It is a short hour because it'll be less than an hour because we we'll have to stick to the guidelines. Um, so you you know I won't be rattling on this morning. So you're safe. You're safe this morning. It was great to be here, and it's great to, to spend time as ever, um, just focusing our hearts and our minds and our thoughts on our Lord and to think about um, the things that He has done for us, the incredible things that He has done, and how that impacts our lives and how that changes us and shapes us. Um, and just at the outset, I want to read um, an extract of uh, some verses out of Psalm 9 to you, just as we do that. It says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Well, so we're going to start this morning um, really by singing, um, Great is thy faithfulness. Um, perfect, look at that. Nigel's on the key. Right up on the screen there for you. Great is thy faithfulness. Um, yeah. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Let's stand if you're happy to stand, sit if you're happy to sit, whatever way you want to go this morning. Please feel free. But let's sing together.
segment and to create it in this way. Our loving Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads before you this morning, we acknowledge your faithfulness at the outset of our service. We acknowledge the, the boundless love that you have for each and every one of us and the, the way that you always come through the way that you are always there for us when we need you. That you have promised that you will never depart from us and you have promised that when we gather together like this, you are with us in an even more special way. And so, Father, we are thankful for that. We acknowledge it and we are thankful. And we do just ask, Father, as we spend this time, that you would speak to us, that you would reveal something new to us, that you would hammer home something maybe that we've heard week in, week out, but that we need to hear time and time again. Whatever it may be, Father, we just long to hear from you, to be guided by you, to be encouraged by you, to be strengthened by you. But Father, as we come, we don't just come to receive what we want to give. We want to give you that praise that you're due, give you that position that you're due in our lives, the honour that is all entirely yours, the glory that is yours. And Father, we know that we can't do that on our own. We can't come into your presence because of who we are, because of the things we have done, the type of people that we are day by day. But we do it because of your Son. We do it because of the sacrifice that was made for us. And so, Father, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that when we ask you to forgive us for those things that we have done in this week past, when we have thought or said or done things that are not right, that are not the way that you would want us to do them, Father, we thank you that because of what he has done, you can remove those from us. And so, Father, it's in that position, it's in that posture that we come to you, Father, as a, a forgiven people, a people released of our guilt and our shame, wanting to worship you, wanting to give you praise, wanting to receive from you this morning. And Father, as we do that this morning, we are mindful that there are many who maybe are, are not able to be with us this morning, and we ask for those who are maybe not so well or who are not comfortable to be here yet, or whatever reasons it may be, Father, bless them, be with them. If they're listening in, Father, give them a real sense of presence that they are with us, maybe not physically, but they are with us with you. And we are thankful for technology, we are thankful for the means to be able to do that. And so again, Father, we ask your blessing on this time together in the name of your precious Son, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. Now, as any good local preacher would have, I have a plastic bag with me. There are no children here this morning, there are two young men, we'll go with that. But um, really, this is, you can grab this as part one and part two will follow, so we'll, we'll go with that. But you have to have a plastic bag, and as I'll tell you, it's just one of the rules, really. So, I have my water with me, which is good because I just saves anybody having to clean out in a bathroom. But I also have what I stole from, from our back garden, um, and I suspect some people will know what this is. You will know what this is? Yeah, I'm sure. It's an American football. Okay, so it's an American football. If this was more normal times, I would get one of you boys down the back and chuck it at you. I'd probably break a window and then I'd get shouted at and get kicked out. But anyway, it's an American football, and I, I love American football. It's a very strange. Um, strange old game, but I love it um, very, very dearly. But what I was wondering, um, the other day, we got this a while back, and it was lying in the back garden getting rained on, because it doesn't get much use in our house, but uh, it was lying in the back garden. And I was thinking to myself again, and I thought it many a time, I thought, American football is a strange name for American football. And again, they play it in America, so the first part makes sense, that bit's okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. But it's the football part I could never really get my head around as to why they call it football, because there's only you know, a couple of times that somebody really kicks it. Most of the time the idea is that you've got you know, four goals to try and move it 10 yards, and each time they tend to sort of pass it or they pass it off to somebody and they run and they clatter into each other. And then eventually, if you don't get it far enough, somebody will kick it, and that happens. But most of the time, they're passing it around and they're not actually kicking it that often. So foot, you know, using your foot doesn't really happen too often. I couldn't quite get my head around. So like any sensible person these days, what do you do? You go on to Google, and Google will usually, that's not going to pass, is it? Um, so I went on to Google, 
had a look at Google and it gave me some answers. And it's not really probably that satisfactory an answer as to why it's actually called American football. The American bit, as I say, is, is quite simple. But whenever football and rugby both came from here and England and all those places, came across to America, they took football and rugby and the American people quite liked them, so they started playing them. And um, what happened was then they, they kind of liked the idea of rugby and they liked the idea of football, which they called association soccer. But then got sort to soccer, which is why uh, Americans call it soccer and we still call it football. Um, and so they, they liked this idea of you know calling this soccer and this was rugby and that was fine. And so they needed to call this game that they invented themselves something else. And so they literally just took the name of football and that's why they call it that. I don't think there's any more logical reason for why it's actually there. So it's not really that clear, it's not really that certain. We can kind of look at it and kind of guess, but that's about as good an answer as anybody seems to have. And if I was calling it something, it would probably be highly unimaginative, like clatter, clatter, bang, bang or something, because it is really, really enormous hits that are going in on these guys. It's massive. But it reminded me um, of, there's a bit in that passage in Acts chapter 11, and towards the end of it, um, there's something really quite special. And it's all about um, the, the early Christians who are being persecuted, and they're scattering, and they're going out to all these different places and telling people about God, and about the amazing things that Jesus has done. And it says in Acts 11 about how God was with them, and he was guiding them, and he was take, they were taking the good news of Jesus to new people. And many, many more people were believing and taking, taking on what they were saying. And then Barnabas gets sent to Antioch. And when he arrived, lots of people were there, they were accepting Jesus, and they were living these amazing lives. And it says um, in verse 24, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And that was the bit that I just wanted to stick on. Because it says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So before that, they were called followers of the way, the way being Jesus. And so that was kind of what everybody said, that there's the followers of the way. But that in Antioch, suddenly they decided, well, hold on a minute, what's different about these people? What are they doing? Well, they're following this guy who's Jesus. They call him the Christ. And what actually are they doing day by day? Well, they're sharing the things they have. They're going to people who are in need. They're giving them whatever they need off their backs to, to look after them. They're looking after each other. They're sharing all they have between themselves. They're living in a different way. They're not selfish. They're being patient. They're living with each other without conflict. What's going on here? And so they started to call that lifestyle, if you like, the people who lived in that way. Well, those are Christian people. Those guys over there living that way, they are Christians because they are following Christ. And you know, for me, it really struck me that a bit like when I look at American football, I don't immediately think that's something that should be called football. And I kind of wonder for myself, whenever people look at my life, whenever people look at me, would it be instantly something that they would say, or they'd say, well, there's a Christian. There is a follower of Christ. There is somebody who knows what Jesus said, or how we should live life, what we should do, and there's somebody who's following his example. And you know, unfortunately for me, I would say for an awful lot of people, that's probably not the case. They're not going to look at me and go, look at that fantastic example of a man. What a Christian, what a follower of Jesus. But for all of us, what a challenge it is to be called Christians. And sometimes we just say it, and it's a fairly glib and an easy thing to say, oh, I'm a Christian. But to think of what it actually means, what it really means to say that you follow Jesus, what it really means to say that you are a Christian. And so I guess for all of us, it's that challenge as we go into another week, and as we'll pick up on this again, but that challenge of who we're going to be, of where we're going to base our decisions, of where we're going to base the choices that we make as we go into, it, and how people will see that, and how they will react. And so I'll leave that there. I say that's part one. We'll not, we'll not claim it's a children's talk for any children this morning, but we, we'll leave that there. We'll, we'll come back to that in a little second. We're going to sing in a little second, but first we're going to read. Um, the song we're going to sing is I Am a New Creation. And that really, to me, was speaking about the fact that when we start to follow Jesus, we are something new. We are something different. And so maybe the life that we've lived beforehand is something that people very much would have said, no, that is not somebody who follows Christ. That is not somebody who's living in a way that follows Jesus. But whenever we follow Jesus, we are a new creation. Day by day, we are a new creation. And we will not get it right all the time. We will not be perfect. But we will work towards that, and he will help us to do that. And that's the amazing truth of our God.
Uh, but I want to read to us just um, from Proverbs chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 6. Uh, I'm just going to come up on the screen as well for you here. So it says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favour and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. And we ask God to bless the reading his word to us this morning. And so now let's as I say, stand if you're content to stand, sit if you want to sit, and we're going to sing together, I am a new creation. Again, showing my age, it was before the times of um, camera phones and people being able to record you 
um, to embarrass you at a later stage. So there's no clips on YouTube, I'm very glad to say, that you can, you can enjoy that with. But it was amazing for me because Channel 4 at that, those days used to show the American football on TV. And you used to see all the, the guys who were commentating and they would, they would talk and they would talk about this guy has done so many yards in this game and he's done so many yards this season and he's comparing him to this guy from 19 whatever it is and this guy's actually rushed you 20 more yards in per game and all this kind of stuff. And it was amazing the number of statistics that they would throw out at you. And it was just a an eye-opener as to how many people not only knew all of these things and kind of had them in pages from, but the guys who could actually say them without even having to look, they just knew all of the information that was there. And then if you fast forward to today, I still am somebody who loves to watch sport and TV, and I was watching um, the golf the other day was on, and there was a, a guy standing on a green pulling, and behind him was this enormous screen, it was physically there right behind him, wasn't somebody that posed these things on the screen, but it was right there behind him, and there was his face, on the screen and they had you know how he was getting on today, they had how far of a putt he had, the percentage of chance he had of getting that putt, how many other people had got that putt, how many putts he had made per season, all this information just coming up behind him on the screen as he was looking at the putt. So statistics and numbers and information just bombarded at us day in day out and I don't know if you're like me but I was fascinated with the last um, US election and I remember sitting um, to all hours and and getting up early and watching just all the information coming through and all the different states and the guys were able to break down this particular bit of this state and the you know men tend to vote for this person females tend to vote for this person and the ethnic breakdowns and all the information the bombardment of election after election and statistic after statistic and they were just throwing it out of the screen so that you could barely keep up with what was going on and it all chimed perfectly with me because I was actually reading at the time of the US election a book called Renaissance by a man called Oz Guinness. And he's a man who writes in such a way that it means that I can recommend wholeheartedly that book to you. I can't tell you a whole pile about it because it is one I need to read again to try and get my head around it. But Oz wrote a, a particular passage that really just jumped out of the page at me. And he was speaking about the, the fact that in the world we live in today, there is almost this worship of statistics. There is almost this need for everybody to have numbers at their fingertips and use that as the basis for how they go forward. And he says, legislation of any practice and then its normalization through numbers need never mean a re-evaluation of what we know to be wrong because God says so, simply because the majority opinion now holds it to be right. 10 million ignorant assertions, even when magnified and accelerated in 100 million tweets and likes, still never adds up to truth or wisdom or what is right and good. And I've given examples there from the sporting world and from the political world, and we've seen how public opinion is sometimes sought in the likes of referendums as well. We know all too well the last one we had in the UK was the one for Brexit. And um, we also know that in Ireland there has been a few of late and a few different referendums. And their ones have really again got to the nub of what as a country Ireland wanted to be seen as and what they felt was important and what they hold as important as the people go to vote. And in such examples of referendums, the terms are preset for how it gets approved or doesn't get approved and whether it's 50% or higher or whatever it is you need to get to. Everybody knows before they cast a vote, this is what we need to get to and this will happen, and the government will enact what gets, gets voted for. But what can happen sometimes is that whenever the votes are cast and the, the, the numbers are counted and people can see where it has gone, sometimes people can react in a way and actually say, well, hold on a minute, if, if so many people have voted for this, if so many people have thought, actually, this is a good idea, if so many people have thought, this is what we need to stand for, this is what we believe, well, then I don't really want to be outside of that. I don't want to be somebody who's actually outside of what, you know, clearly most people think it's right, so it must be right, so I'm going to go with that. And maybe they will change their opinion because of how everyone else has voted and how everyone else seems to feel about something. And I'm not here this morning to either have a go at or support referendums as a way of doing things, and I'm not even here to get into the specific details of the ones that I've re referred to um, already. But what I wanted to simply say this morning was that when it comes to making our decisions, 
when it comes for us to be deciding what direction we will take in life as Christians as we're ready to find what it means to be a Christian to be someone who follows Jesus who takes on board what he has said and doesn't just listen and go well that's lovely that's really nice but actually does something with that information where do we take our lead whenever we need to make a decision about something whenever we need to form an opinion where do we go to to get our lead in that where do we take our cue as to what is right is right or wrong what is acceptable or what is to be rejected and opposed and all too easily we can also be swayed by numbers a growing number of people around us who can maybe hold a contrary view we don't want to be seen as the ones who are maybe out of touch we don't want to be seen as the ones who are maybe outside of what the majority of people maybe now hold on to and we can easily lose sight of where we need to anchor ourselves and where we need to always take as our reference our reading was taken from proverbs 3 and in verses 5 and 6 we have those uh, most famous exhortations to not lean on our own understanding but to submit to god to submit to his ways his wisdom his understanding of what is best his understanding of what is good for us we know from being able to read his word how god wants us to treat each other we know what he has to say in a whole range and a whole spectrum of issues and matters that still confront us today and so the choice has to come for us are we going to rely and lean on our own understanding based on what the world may tell us and the information we can bring in will we look at opinion polls online will we open our newspaper to see what the most people seem to think about a particular issue or a particular topic or are we going to look to him are we going to continue to study his word so that we are submitting to him and allowing him to make our paths straight the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to Timothy, said in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The wisdom that we all say we want to have, because after all, who among us actually says, I don't want to be wise? I really don't want to be a wise person. It's not something that we do. We all want to be wise. But it comes from our dedication and our reliance on the scriptures that we've ready access to. And in today's world, we have a wealth and amazing resources that will help us to explore it, that will help us to understand and to glean from it what we need to. But we need to continue on in that vein. We need to retain our focus beyond just our own whims or our own ideas, beyond the pressure of mounting numbers beyond the pressure of mounting statistics and percentages of the world around us and we need to continue to have confidence in the one that we have learned these things from in our passage in verse 1 it says that we are to not forget we are to not forget and it seems like a really obvious thing to say and it is but if you do not forget something you need to know what it is in the first place it's really, really obvious, but if you're not going to forget something, you need to actually know what it is in the first place. And so the challenge for each of us is, again, are we taking that seriously? Are we diving in to see, well, what does God actually think about X, Y, and Z? What does he think about all the things that are happening in the world around us? What does he think about my heart? What does he think about the way that I live and the things that I do? And unless we're actually finding those things out, then as it says in verse 1, we can't forget it if we don't know it to start with. And as we read through God's word, sometimes there are things that will jar with us. There are things that will jolt at us and make us think, hold on a minute. Actually, God is saying this whenever maybe I thought the other was the way to be. And sometimes it's really clear and really obvious and we can see how to do it. And we see the example from the early Christians as we uh, have already looked at as well, of how they lived their lives, how obvious it was, how clear it was for the people around them so that they renamed them because of the example of how they were doing things. But if we're doing that, and if we're truly doing that, if we're truly working to live our lives as Christians, and again, I'm, I will have to say I'm not for a second suggesting that we, we work hard and we will get there. That is not at all what I am saying. We all know that we are saved by God's grace and God's grace alone. But our responsibility is what are we going to do with that? How are we going to act on that? Because we can't just go, well, that's great, that's me sort of, I'm just going to sit here and that's fine. We know that we have responsibility to move on. 
But if we're doing that and we're truly doing that, we're truly working and striving to be more like Jesus. <coughs> to be people who are recognizably different, people who are distinguishable from the world around us, not opposed to it. We're not aggressive towards it, but we're filled with love for those who would hate us. We're filled with compassion for those who are downtrodden. We're filled with righteous anger for those who are the poorest and the weakest, who are neglected or who are beaten down. If that's what we're doing, then we're leaning on his understanding and we're not leaning on ours. And when we do that, we don't do it so that other people say, look at that fantastic person. Look at how amazing they are. Aren't they an amazing person to want to be like? We're actually doing it clearly so that we can use our voice, we can use our platform, we can use our opportunities to make sure that his name is the one that is honoured. His name is the one that is given the position that it is due. And we're pointing people continually to him and away from ourselves. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 9 and verse 10 that we stopped at says, Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. So I hope that as we go into this week, if you're watching some sport and you see some statistics, you'll maybe uh, consider that. If you're following some political battle, if there's a by-election happening somewhere or something like that, you'll see all the numbers getting thrown at you. And you can see all of these things playing out in the world around us. But when it comes to your life, when it comes to who you are, when it comes to the person that you want to be, that you're trying to be, the things you want to achieve, that you're leaning on his understanding, that you're relying on his guidance, his wisdom, trusting in him and knowing that he will not forsake you. And as it says in that verse, that he will not forsake those who seek him. And I know for all of us the blessing that we would see and experience that we could even begin to grasp the truth of that in our lives. We're going to finish by singing again and as God sent his son, they called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. That's the truth of who we are, the truth of the message that we have. And it is ours to share with those around us. And as I say, it's not just always going to be in the words that we share, but the way that we live and the acknowledgement of others that there is something different. And then that they too can see that God sent his son for them as well. Let's stand again and sing together. God sent his son.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.